Good morning, 8.01, 8B4. This is Miss Lawson bringing you uh, another week's worth of work for our scheme of work, which is all centred around the Ethereum legend, the legend of King Arthur. Um, I've had some really good feedback from you this week in terms of enjoying the, the work and, and just being really engaged, so really well done. It could well be that they are some of the year teams are really doing their best to make sure that you're feeling a part and, and you know, integral in this process, because you are integral, because otherwise... What's the point of me sitting here? I need you. I need you to give me your work and your feedback. And even if you're not giving me your work, at least you're doing the work. And I've spoken to some of you, but I'm sending it. You are doing it. So really well done. And the reason why it's so imperative, it's so important, you do your absolute. And I don't just mean your best, as in, mm, I'll just do a little bit here and there. It's because you're heading off into year nine. And it is so important that, you know, I as a teacher see you through um, the whole of year eight. That's my promise to you. That's been my promise to every single one of you, 61 of you, when I took you on in September, and I want to see it through. So let's just really knuckle down this last few weeks and give it everything that you've absolutely got. Um, you know, my own children, and it sounds like a bit of a Jack and Norris story time, um, but probably a reference, you won't get that to me. Um, but my own children, I'm like, oh, God, you know, I don't want to do the work, I'd rather do this. Well, just think about it. You used to have seven hours over two weeks plus an hour's homework. That's eight hours. So let's divide that by two. That should be four hours of English. And that'd be four hours of maths. And that'd be four hours of science. You're not going to necessarily be doing four hours of English. So you are actually doing less work. That I'm expecting less work. But ultimately, you know, you should be doing a substantial amount of work. And is it because I'm here to nag? No, it's because I care. Um, and your parents and your guardians, your caregivers care, Sammy Ward care. We just want the absolute best for you. So follow along with these lessons as best as possible. Go back if you need to. Um, I know lots of you are, but let's just keep it up for the final few, few weeks and then it's some holidays. OK, so as per usual, now I've had my little rant and my little moan. I'm not moaning. I'm not moaning. I'm not, I promise you. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, give you some gusto and some welly into your work. Um, right, let's go over, let's start with the do now task. The reason why I'm starting with the do now task is because I really want you to have a lovely uh, collection and really a lovely kind of rich tapestry of new words that you can incorporate into your work next year, okay? So this week's for the do now task, and I will go over last week's as well, by the way, and we'll go over the definitions of last week's um, for the key vocabulary, just to make sure that you've got the right definitions. So this week is derived, verified, originated corruption and formally pause this video take five ten minutes yes you may use your phone and um and, and google and look up those words and also come up with a synonym because sometimes the definition probably doesn't mean necessarily everything to you but if you give it a synonym you find a similar word with the same meaning then it's just going to embed that in for you so five ten minutes let's go okay and last week I set you these words, um, unreliable, not able to be relied upon or doubtful, variance, a form of or version of something that differs in some way, credence, the likelihood of something being true, so plausibility or reliable, interpretation, the act, action of explaining the meaning, uh, engendered, this is the word that people got um, a bit confused, engendered is to cause or give rise to. So let me just put it into context for you in terms of this story, this book. There's been many interpretations of this original story. We cannot give credence to how it started because the, uh, the historical evidence is unreliable. There's many variants of the story of how it originated. And actually, because it was translated and it's been passed through down the years, um, it's engendered these different interpretations and these different invariants. That's how I would put it into a sentence. It's essentially saying there's been different versions of it throughout the years and things have been uh, changed and, and interpreted differently. So they're the reasons why I'm giving you these words. Um, double check that you have the correct um, definition for engendered, please. Some of you got endangered, slightly different. Okay. In terms of this week's work, I've been absolutely blown away um, by the efforts of your fact files is really well done. Um, I mean, some of these are absolutely wonderful. I've given R1s and R2s to those people who have not only just given my work, but just given them that little bit extra. Um, even if you haven't, and you've just literally typed out a few lines, thank you. I mean, you've got an R1 for just sending me your work, so I know that you're accessing these lessons. We have three slides of this amazing work as well, so I'm just very, very proud of every single one of you that has sent work in. 
Um, and let's have a look here. Now, the reason why I've made this um, this kind of idea of everyone else's work is I wanted to show you what is capable at home. Um, and I just want to just sing your praises, essentially. Um, so thank you. What we have to do today is chapter three and four. Um, you're going to go away and read with that PDF that I sent you, chapters three and four. So let's just have a little quick recap. Chapter one, we had the idea of this the story of this boy, and he decided that he was going to make it try to island hop via walking uh, whilst the tide was out. Okay, and he felt like he timed everything correctly. It's around the Isles of Scilly, the Scilly Isles. Um, and he timed it correctly to make sure that he could get there and back again in time before the tide arose. Rose. And um, essentially he fell asleep, um, very foolishly. He fell asleep, the tide came in, but he was pulled out of the water by someone called Arthur Pendragon. And Arthur, as we find uh, later on, as we go on with the story, he's actually uh, basically King Arthur, isn't he? He's the High King of Britain. And we follow along with that story of how he, he came to be. And whilst he's nursing um, the boy back to health with the lovely dog. <coughs> um, so what you need to be doing is going back to chapters three and four, pausing this video, go and read it, and then come back because all the work that's going to be coming up is going to be based on those two chapters. And I do believe in modelling um, reading. I do feel like reading in class is so important. If I read chapters three and four and I have practised, this lesson would be about an hour and 10 minutes long. So I don't want necessarily to read chapters three and four with you. However, I am going to be reading certain key extracts with you just to be able to model um, those that, that language and those words. So pause this video, go and read. It should take you about 20, 25 minutes. Okay, and another thing that I want to embed in this, um, this kind of scheme of work, this scheme of learning, is um, the etymology. <clears throat> Excuse me, I know lots of you um, really love learning where words come from. You like sounding them out and seeing if you can find uh, similarities between words that you already know and these new words. So let's have a look at um, the word Camelot. Okay, so Camelot is, is where obviously the castle, we're going to learn more about that within chapters three and four. So the name's derivation is uncertain. It has numerous different spellings in medieval French, uh, French Arthurian romances. So again, it's these different variants of the Arthurian story. Remember, Michael Mapago, he's just one variant of it. Um, if you can have a look at here, all the different spellings in, in French uh, novels. Arthurian scholar Ernst Brugger, Brugger suggested that it was a corruption of the site of Arthur's final battle, the Battle of Camelot in Welsh tradition. So, so far we've got Welsh uh, and, sorry, French. Roger Sherman Loomis believed it was derived from Cavalon, a place name that he suggested was a corruption of Avalon. Um, he further suggested that Cavalon became Arthur's capital due to confusion with Arthur's other traditional court at Caer Leon in Welsh again. So if you can see, there's just all these different variants of how the name Camelot is, is, uh, has arrived, how we've arrived to it. Others have suggested it originated from the British Iron Age, a Romano-British place named, <laughs> prepare, Camulodunum, one of the first capitals of Roman Britain and which would have been significant in Romano-British culture. And also in 1542, John Leland reported the locals around Cadbury Castle, formerly known as Camelot in Somerset, considered to be the original Camelot. So everyone's got this idea that they they know where the word or the castle uh, of Camelot came from. But again, there's, we can't really verify it, can we? Um, it's just been adapted and changed the course of the time. Remember, with, there is no real um, artifacts that we can actually date and prove. So it's just down to different people's interpretations. And actually, you can see it's worldwide, which is really interesting. Sadly, Cadbury Castle wasn't made of chocolate. Just felt like I needed to put on that and then I'm sorry if that's made you hungry. Um, right, so the actual terms of work, so you should have your do now task and you should be feeling really proud of yourselves if you have done the work so far because I've given you praise. Um, these are certain extracts of chapters three and four which you should have read by this point in the lesson. You are going to have to read it, there is no getting out of it. Um, it doesn't do you any harm to just read two chapters for me. Um, but there are certain descriptions of of the location, of the setting of this castle, 
Um, so let's read these. Um, I had built there a hilltop castle surrounded by marshes and safe from the world, and here I returned to rest after the Saxon wars. Early one morning I was up for the hunt when a young squire came riding into the castle courtyard. That evening in the courtyard I was leaning on my staff and gazing at the shields of the two kings hanging on the walls when Merlin came out to join me. The staff I have for you, he said, may I borrow it for a moment? And with that he took it from me and plunged it in the ground and at once a tree sprang up, a sapling first and then a great oak tree spreading until it was towering over the courtyard. And the next morning I was up early and met Merlin at the ramparts. He was looking over the mist-covered marshes and there were three horses prodding slowly along the causeway. Well, why are those key? Why are those um, descriptions key? Well, we can get such an, a vivid imagination uh, or the imaginative idea in our heads of what the castle would have been looking like and where it would have been set. So here we have a hilltop castle, so we don't look high, but it's surrounded by marshes, it was safe from the world. We know that there was a castle courtyard. Uh, we know that um, there would be shields of the two kings hanging on the walls by the courtyard or inside the courtyard. Um, the staff here it doesn't mean workforce, guys. It means like, you know, the wooden stick. Um, and it plunged it into the ground. Um, and a tree, so there's some trees, a sapling at first, and a great oak tree. And then we also know here again, there's mist-covered marshes. And there was a causeway, which is another sort of type of lane or road leading through the marshes. So immediately we're getting that idea of this castle is up high, it's marshy, um, but there is a little road that's cutting through, cutting through the marshes. And also there's a courtyard with um, shields on it. So there are more descriptions in there throughout the chapters three and four. And so what I'm really, really um, interested in seeing is your interpretation, there's that word again, interpretation of Camelot. Okay, so task one, <clears throat> this is where it's going to get fun for you. Using a description of Camelot, your imagination and research, and um, this is the challenge part, you may well need to go off and actually research it. Again, you're going to come across different versions, different variants of Camelot, but Google and research away. Um, and I'd like you to draw your own impression of Camelot, as much detail as you can. Some of you are going to be better at that. Um, Ramport or Rampart. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with. Like I said, I think I've been living in a cave when it comes to King Arthur. Um, some of you are going to be more familiar with castles. Um, then task two, and this is the part, the English part, so this might well be uh, considered slightly arty. Um, I don't know why that says not, clearly now. Annotate your diagram with strong description based on your interpretation. Integrate those words into your diagram through labels. So there are some here, so you can actually have your picture and you can actually just put um, some descriptive uh, phrases, descriptive words onto your picture so that you're actually getting this real true sense um, of what that Camelot Castle means to you. So I've managed to come up with magnificent, majestic, refined, sturdy, imposing, formidable, glorious, austere, astonishing, perfunctory, idyllic. And then you can pair them with a physical feature to create a little uh, alliteration as well. Um, so if you have perhaps a describing word or an adjective that begins with W, you could describe the walls, wondrous walls, for instance. Um, I would like to see what you can uh, come up with that. These are the words I've used from a thesaurus, so please, please, please always make sure that you're pushing the vocabulary as high as you can go. Don't just say it's um, high, towering walls. Say they're imposing. Okay, really give it that the extra descriptive element. Um, um, you don't have to be an artist. You really don't. You know what my art is like. My art is atrocious, but I like to think that I can come up with some really good words. Whatever you don't do in art, you make up with some descriptive words. Um, in terms of this little guy here, uh, I saw this from one of my friends, and their son has actually even gone to the point of making a castle now, guys. Um, I'm going to put a little challenge down. If you feel that perhaps you would have a spare few hours, you've got some recycling mucking around the house, I would really, really love to be able to hand out some R3s and R4s. If you wanted to go about making your own Camelot castle, I would absolutely, I'm going to be blown away. Um, it is just a fun project. It is not necessary. It is totally optional. All the other tasks that are in this aren't, okay, and the reading isn't, but the making of a castle, but can you imagine if I can take a picture of your castle 
and, and pop it on, on Twitter for everyone to see. Um, I'd love it. Um, and it might just keep you busy. Uh, some people are, you know, a little lost at what to do with their time. So go and make a little Camelot cast based on the description from the book. It has to be accurate. Okay. So task three. So task one and two, draw the one, annotate with um, some powerful language and words and phrases for task two. Now task three. Um, there are two scenes and I'm going to read them uh, for you. They come from chapters three and four, so you should be familiar with them. Um, let's read through them again and then I'm going to start to some sort of questioning with you. Um, I'm going to upload these two extracts to go to schools with this PowerPoint this, this lesson so you will be able to um, either print it off or at least just have it on a screen on your phone so you can make notes. Um, so in that case I said bristling at the man's arrogance. In that case you'd better get up on your horse because it, is, it all pleases me to knock people off horses. People like you, he smiled, swung nimbly up on his horse and settled in the saddle. Well, he said, what are you waiting for? We rode away from each, uh, each other a short distance, turning couched our, I think it was couched our spears under our shoulders. I felt my horse gathering himself under me. I touched him with my heels and unleashed him. He sprang forward. I pointed my spear at the centre of Pelinor's shield and braced for the shock, all of me clenched. Both spears splintered at once on impact. You're good, he cried as he turned his horse snorting and prancing. You're very good, but not good enough. We'll do it again, shall we? And he called for more spears. That was when I noticed Bertolet walking off fully into the forest. I wondered for a moment what he was doing, where he was going. That's a sensible dog you have, King Pelinor scoffed. He knows when to run. You want to go with him? I took the spear I was offered. You're full of talk, I cried. Come on, and we charged again. Again, the spears disintegrated, but this time I was nearly unhorsed and I knew I had met my match. A third time I pounded towards him, shield held tight to my body, leaning over my spear, and every fibre of my strength concentrated on the point of my spear, and the point of my spear at the centre of his shield, at his heart. Maybe my horse swerved at the last moment, but maybe I overreached myself. Who knows? Either way, I was caught off balance. He lifted me clean out of my saddle and dumped me in the dust, the breath knocked out of me. Spurred to fresh anger at this indignity, I was on my feet at once, sword drawn and waiting for him. He dismounted, whipped out his sword and came at me like a wild thing, driving me back and back. I counted all I could, bending him off with my shield and then my shield flew from my grasp. There was my blood running down my neck and I knew suddenly that I wasn't fighting any more to win. I was fighting for my life. Okay, so that... Uh, it comes from a fight scene. So if you can imagine them jousting. If you've ever seen people jousting, they're on the backs of horses and they're coming at each other. Um, so what I'd like you to do, you know, you can either, like I said, if you're going to have a print or you're going to have an option to be able to put it onto a Word document, you can highlight. Um, and like I said, if you even have it on your computer and you can't physically print it off, you can still highlight um, certain words in a different colour. Um, I would like you to find range of punctuation. You do this all the time in class, so you should know this. Uh, punctuation, powerful verbs, so verbs to do things, so powerful doing things. Short and long sentences, adverbs, so end, uh, words that end in ly, how, how we do things, happily, sadly. Imagery, rhetorical questions, and can you notice any semantic field choices? Or has he kept uh, how more per go? used uh, or incorporated words from a certain semantic field if you can highlight and annotate that. This will probably take you, in order to do it correctly and properly, 10 minutes to, be able to go through that minimum. And then you're going to have on the bottom of your sheet, so you can lay it out on a piece of paper, question A and question B. What is the relationship or link between the tone and the sentence types or structure? How has he created the tone using the sentence type? And B, how would you describe the effect that Michael Wapergo is trying to achieve in this extract? What do you think he's trying to give us? This one might be slightly longer than this question. Um, answer A and B once you've highlighted and annotated. And in total, that's going to take you probably 15 to 20 minutes. So again, you can imagine you were in class, get the highlighters out of the drawer, you'd be there for 20 minutes. Then, then another task. So this is... 
from the same book. It's a scene slightly later on. Um, and it's called the Lady of the Lake scene. And this is um, going to link in with something else that we're going to tie into the scheme of work. So it's quite important, this part. And again, we're going to do exactly the same thing that you did in your last extract. So you might have gone away and had some lunch and you'll come back and do this one or you can do it all in one sitting. Again, you can highlight on a Word document uh, or you can write notes as you're reading it. Um, so you're looking for punctuation, powerful verbs, short and long sentences, again, adverbs, imagery, and again, any use of any particular semantic field that you can see. Let's read through this together. I looked and but could not see, I could see nothing at first, but then as I looked, I saw the surface of the lake shiver and break, and to my amazement, up out of the lake came a shining sword, a hand holding it, and an arm in a white silk sleeve. There, Merlin whispered, you have your answer. That is Excalibur. It comes with that half-world of Avalon, the blade forged by the elf kind, the scabbard woven by the lady who knew herself. The lady of the lake and my lady too. And as he spoke her name, his voice faltered. See, here she comes. And out of the mists came a figure in flowing green, walking across the water. <clears throat> Yet the water seemed undisturbed beneath her feet as if she were walking on air. She came towards us holding a scabbard in both her hands and a sword belt hanging from it. From the way she looked at Merlin and from the way he was looking at her, I could see there was an old love between them, a love still strong. There was a secret smile in her eyes, and it was all for him. But when she spoke, she spoke to me. So if you compare it immediately between the two different extracts, one is clearly a fight scene, and one is this most magical, almost romantic moment within the book. Same book, same writer, but they are very clearly different. And how are they different? Well, it's not just the subject. There are ways that he has done it and created differently. So again, you do what I've just said for the first one, and then you answer A and B. What is the relationship and link between the tone and the sentence types and structure? And how would you describe the effect that Michael Mopergo is trying to achieve in this extract? Simple two questions. I don't want paragraphs. We don't need to have a long answer in this particular this part. Because once you've got these two extracts sorted, then your task five should take care of itself. So go away and take 10, 15, 20 minutes just to think about those answers. Okay, and this is where your task five will all come into play. So, <clears throat> one comparative paragraph with examples and evidence, please. How do the two extracts differ in style and tone? And how are they similar in style and tone? So, a comparative paragraph. To be comparative, you're drawing a comparison between the two. So comparison, you're bringing up one against the other and you're pitting them against each other and you're seeing how are they similar and how are they dissimilar. It's so important. Um, you can find some similarities. Of course you can because they're from the same book. So you can talk about similarities, but I'm really crudely looking for the dis dissimilarities, the differences between the two. You could write about the tone. Perhaps one is humorous, serious, or tense, or romantic. Perhaps the language, the word choice, the literary techniques, the rhetorical devices are different. I could say immediately, if you've annotated those two extracts properly, you will see there's a massive difference. Structure, the order of ideas, repetition, the sentence structure, this is crucial. You will notice the sentence structures are vastly different between the two extracts. And just as we would always say in class, you need to relate it back to the audience or the reader. So what was Mark Ergo trying to achieve with each extract? So I think that that's, one, that's quite a simple one comparative paragraph. When then you get to a bit, a bit older and you're starting to answer questions like, such as this in exams, or for instance, you would have to do more than one paragraph. You'd probably have to do two to compare. You'd do one paragraph for one, one paragraph for the other and by all means if you want to do more than one paragraph brilliant but like, the bare minimum is one and the way that you're going to start and structure your sentences and your answers I've been giving you some tips down here this is how I'd go about it it's really easy to be able to just use this this scaffolding here to be able to incorporate and uh, to use sorry into your paragraph the tone in the fight scene is more you tell me the writer uses you tell me 
Um, this is where you'd put perhaps uh, the technique, for instance, and then you'd give me the example. You'd take a quote from, because remember, you need examples and evidence. Take it from the extract you're looking at, and you tell me what it's trying to, to suggest. So to suggest the danger of the situation, perhaps, or the magical and shocking tone in the Lady of the Lake scene is also suggested by, within the line, and the contrast of this, whatever well, you've mentioned, to the other extract makes the text very effective. You can see here, we're talking about the effect on the audience and the reader. In the fight scene, the lots of single clause short sentences build tension for the reader. And that's probably the longest, most building sentence I've given you, but you need to carry that on. I have no qualms and no issues with you using um, using my scaffolding. Absolutely use them, but change them and adapt them. How? What? Which ones do you find most interesting? Personally, I think the sentence structures is something that you can really talk about. When you're answering questions like this, it's also it's not we're not just looking at the words. We could look at the words. The fact that um, within the second extract, um, he's saying he whispered things, for instance, whereas the first extract he's shouting. That's quite an obvious one. One's a fight scene. One's kind of a lovely, you know, magical, mystical uh, moment. Um, but structure, structure, let's try and focus on structure. We want to get you to that point where you can talk about structure of extracts. So sentence structure, really, really crucial. Um, are they longer? Are they shorter in the second one? Um, is there the use of dialogue and speech in the first one, which breaks out, which gives us a sense of action, perhaps? Is there a range of punctuation? Perhaps one has uh, rhetorical questions, which then what? What does that do? What does a rhetorical question create for us as a reader? Well, we're getting an insight into someone's head, aren't we, with a rhetorical question and making us think about what the person is thinking. So talk about structure. Like I said, the answers um, of the sentence types that you can use are here. Um, this whole PowerPoint will be available on both the scores and on Teams so that you can access it at any point. Um, so let's just clarify um, before I leave you lovely year eights. So what you're going to do is you're going to do now task. You're going to double check that your definitions from last week are correct. Then you're going to draw me a picture of what you imagine Camelot to look like. And then you're going to annotate it with at least probably 10, 15 um, uh, really descriptive words or phrases to describe it. It's not just an art lesson. Task three, annotate the fight scene. Task four, annotate the love scene. And then task five. Like I said, you are supposed to be doing, on average, four hours of English a week. And if I want you to be able to move up into year nine with the best foundation, the best footing, you're going to try to get this done. I'm probably thinking this whole time it's going to take about two hours this week. doesn't have to be done today. Some of you are getting me this work within like the same day, and that's brilliant. And that, that's how you, you are working. Um, I know lots of people are asking how they do it. And, you know, you know that I have children that are going through this, the same thing. What I say to them is... Uh, I set them three hours every day between 9 and 12 and they structure and they think, right, all my lessons are coming in on Monday. I'm going to work out which bit I'm going to do each day. It's a little block each day. And then the time Saturday comes, you've done your week's learning and your weekend is yours. Any other questions, please don't hesitate to email me or contact me um, unless it's about asking about how atrocious my hair is, in which case, please don't. Um, I'm waiting for a hairdresser, just like half the population. Um, hope you have a lovely week and I shall speak to you soon. Take care.